Welcome to The Road Home with Jamil Giovanni. On this episode of The Road Home, I will be speaking with Jason Blackwood, who is the founder and CEO of a clothing company based in Toronto called Grand Slammers. Jason is also the author of a book called I Am Jane and Finch, named after the neighborhood that he's from called Jane and Finch in Toronto. I want to start uh, this episode by discussing a study that I think will help set some context for our conversation today. And I'm going to quote um, some writing by Amy Rosen, who is from the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship in the Harvard Business Review. And so Amy writes about that young people who are engaged in more aggressive, illicit, risk-taking activities, scoring higher on learning aptitude tests, having greater self-esteem than their peers, and being more likely to undertake entrepreneurship ventures as adults. And she says, and I quote, It makes sense that rule breakers are well positioned to start businesses. Entrepreneurs are more comfortable setting their own rules than staying within limits set by others. And they often have a little respect for authority, educational, cultural, or even legal. And with that quote, I thought Amy did a great job of summarizing the connection between a young person in a difficult situation, willing to take risks, sometimes dangerous, harmful, and illegal ones, to better his or her situation. And to see how that impulse might be transferable to positive behaviors, meaning behaviors around starting a business, being an entrepreneur, innovating inventing new ideas, new approaches to solving old problems. Jason, the founder of Grand Slammers, is actually a tremendous example, I think a walking testament to Amy Rosen's research because he talks about in their conversation today the appeal of making money, right? That he was broke and he was trying to figure out how to make money And he took some wrong turns and considered illegal activity in making money, right? And instead of, you know, thankfully, he has moved away from those illegal activities and, you know, changed his peer group and and, and organized his life in a positive way. But what's important to, to gain from Jason's story is that he didn't give up on wanting to be rich, Right. He didn't say money's now not my priority or money's not important to me. Instead, he said there's a better way to make money. And I think that's a really key part of wanting to empower and support young people in low income environments. That often youth programming, youth policy doesn't really grasp. And what I mean by that is. A lot of people who go into the nonprofit sector, who work in charity, who work in public policy, are not people who are motivated by money. A lot. Not all, of course, but a lot of them are not. That's part of the appeal of working in a more charitable, public-serving capacity. And I think they don't always understand or relate to the impulse of saying, no, I want to be rich. Like, to you... This might be a social issue, but to me, this is, I want to be rich, right? And a lot of young people, that's how they feel. Their ambition is to make money. So in this conversation with Jason, I think you'll see that his ability to channel that spirit, that ambition, that desire into running and starting his own business. And I think that there's some really instructive elements for how to communicate about that and how to hopefully better understand it so we can apply it more broadly in our society. But I also think that there's another element to Jason's story that's worth noting as well. And I'm going to go back to some other research on this, which is research on entrepreneurship 
and <clears throat> how businesses are started. There is a 2014 study of data by the U.S. Small Business Administration. And what it found was that fewer than 4% of 30-year-olds reported they were in full-time self-employment compared to 5.4% of Generation Xers and 6.7% of baby boomers at the same age. Okay, so follow me here. A generation ago, 5.4% of 30-year-olds were entrepreneurs. And a generation before that, 6.7% of 30-year-olds. But in 2014, in my generation, in the millennial generation, only 4%. Now, the reason why that's significant is I think sometimes there's a myth going around that millennials, and perhaps even more true for people younger than us, are a self-starter generation. We have access to platforms and social media new technologies, new ways of branding ourselves. And we also have, you know, the folklore of a Facebook uh, story and Mark Zuckerberg. And we take all these things and we assume that we're living in this age where entrepreneurship is at an all-time high, where young people are starting businesses and getting rich and making moves. But the evidence suggests that that's actually not the case, that we're less likely to be starting businesses than our parents or our grandparents and that means we're more risk averse, right? We're afraid to take risks. That's an important data point to keep in mind because if we want to understand how to build more business acumen among young people who have an appetite to take risks in order to better their economic conditions, then it might be worthwhile to also understand what barriers might be in their way to starting a business and succeeding. Now, Jason speaks about these issues from a very firsthand practical perspective and will outline some of the ways he's been successful. And also, I think you'll hear some of the obstacles he's also had to overcome, which may be relevant to the entrepreneurship journey of a lot of other young people as well. So we also talk uh Jason and I about his neighborhood, Jane and Finch, which we've discussed on a previous episode of this podcast as well. But I always think it's important to acknowledge that there is a community in Toronto, Jane and Finch, that has been very meaningful as a source of support, education, and also hardship for a lot of young people who are out in Toronto and the rest of the world trying to make a real positive difference. I think it's one of the more poorly understood and maligned parts of Toronto. And anytime we can acknowledge the positives of the area and the people who are making a difference, not, not, the, not the political folks who want to turn this neighborhood into, their, to, into a story that's good for their agenda, but I'm talking about the everyday people on the ground who are connecting with one another and trying to do really good things, not just for that neighborhood, but for... Toronto, for Canada, for the world. And Jason will talk a bit about Jane and Finch as well. So I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. I bring you Jason Blackwood. So Jason, your your recently published book yes. is titled I Am Jane and Finch. And that's a powerful title. Why did you choose it? The reason why I created the book Jane and F I Am Jane and Finch is because I'm from, I was born and raised in Jane and Finch. I'm from the inner community. And I always felt like we were counted out and we needed a voice. And I'm a person that can relate to different fields of life because I've been in the streets and now I'm a CEO of my own creation. So that's the reason why I created it. I am this book, I am Jane Finch. So also people like me in the inner community know there's more to life and they can try new things. Hmm. So, so talk me through your transformation. Like where were you at, at 10 years ago? 10 years ago, that was my high school. Hmm. I was in high school. I was in 
a very good basketball player. I believe I was not being cocky or nothing, but I was like probably the best in my f age, 88. There was Alex Johnson, who was very good. There was DeVoe, who made it to the NBA. I mean, Corey Joseph, who made it to the NBA. I played against these type of players. But even before that, I've been playing ball from when I was in grade four, grade five. And I was, I was with my brother, Chris Blackwood. And I was, wherever Chris played, I was with him. So I was just around older people from when I was young. I was always older than my age in, a, in heart. And with that, to say this, I used to play with them too. Like Denim Brown, I used to see Denim Brown, all the best basketball players playing Jane Finch. So I used to play against them too. So when I came to me playing against my own age group, um, I just felt I had over knowledge. I had lots of knowledge more than them because I put in the hours. Yeah. And uh, 10 years ago, yeah. But 10 years ago, also, I was thinking it was very, I was in a hard spot because I wanted to know if I was going to go to the NBA or if I was going to stay, be in the streets because. Wait, so when you say in the streets, what does that mean? So in the streets, what they say in the streets, I just, I just think it's. That's a word, just where it's like survival is just where you're trying to get jobs and there's no jobs in the area, you know, and there's no elders telling you how to create an income, but what you see in front of you is like, you know, I sold, I used to sell backwards back in the days to show you where my mind frame was. Mm. I was around people who, not bad people at all, they just, were entrepreneurs in their own field. They, they couldn't get hired. They, they, they had criminal records probably. That was probably the case. How come they never got hired? But they weren't bad workers. So to, that, to say this, to say that it was, I took that event, I took, I used to sell a little bit of trees back in the day to my friends because I used to smoke weed. And then I realized that from there, I wanted to be my own boss. I think that's a characteristic a lot of young dudes have, right? A lot, and a lot of the guys are getting in trouble too. It's like they want to be their own boss. They want to do things for themselves. They want to kind of stand on their own. And sometimes it's the the illegal business gives them that opportunity mm -hmm. before the legal business does, right? How much legal? All right. So for to say that you are right. So let me go deeper. If they knew better, they would. If I knew better, like. I see my brother doing gentleman hats, so I always knew to do better. But before my brother, if you're in the community and there's no outlets, where are you supposed to know this knowledge? Where are you supposed to get this awareness from? Who are you supposed to get this awareness from? If they're saying your mom or dad, if they don't know better, who are you going to go listen to? Yeah. So you're in this spot, right? Where you're like, maybe I'll go to the NBA, maybe I'll be in the streets. Like, what's where? Because I was supposed to, because I was really went to Emory to be, because I was very good in basketball. Like, I thought I was really going to make it to the NBA. Um, I made it into Rumble and T dot two times in a row. That's that's a basketball all star game. Only the all stars from that generation gets from each east to the west gets to play in one all star game, and I got it to play in it two times in a row. I took my team to 4A also, so, but I didn't get no recognition. I didn't get no scholarships. I don't know if, why, because my marks, I believe also in the city that marks was probably the reason why I didn't get, but I don't feel like marks should have been the reason why I didn't get no scholarships either. So also I feel like the coaches has a big part. What do you mean by that? Because the coaches are the ones who gets the, the scholarships for the for the for the players, and if the co coach doesn't vote for you, doesn't believe that you're going to represent them to the best of their ability, they hold back um, scholarships from their players, mm. and I seen that firsthand. What? Why would a coach not be supportive of you? What was going on? Because you know they they don't they know you're from Jane and Finch. You know they know you're from in the community. You know they probably know that you smoke a little weed. You know certain things you know so that's why i wanted to become my own entrepreneur because even i created a business with my family I'm not saying who but we created a construction business and i was like the boss but i didn't really know how to do the flooring or anything i just knew how to run operations how to 
close sales, get the sale done. So with that being said, I lost because I wasn't, I was the boss, but I wasn't the boss because without my dad, I didn't know how to do the outlets. So with that experience, I said, you know, I need to do something that I can control. So I created a brand. I could have been a rapper. You know, I, I think I would have been the best rapper, one of the best rappers if I wanted to. But I said, that's not the lifestyle or the image I want now. Because mm -hmm. I was, people know me in the ball world. People know who I am. So if I didn't make it for ball, I wanted to be left as somebody who's doing something big in the city or who was not like a waste person or a bad criminal youth. So I created Grand Slammers and the rest was history. Yeah. You, you told me earlier that um, you thought a skill that would benefit a lot of young people in the neighborhood is learning how to do sales. That's the main thing. Why? Because, because why you would want to teach the kids to go get a job to get money, right? That's the main thing, right? So why not teach them how to create sales, how to make money? Not in no school system I learned how to make money. The best math ever was my middle school and elementary school. And thank you, God, and middle school because that was the basic math. Multiplication, subtraction, ad addition, and division. That's all I need in math. When you're paying bills, when you're paying your rent, when you're paying car notes, it comes back to multiplication, subtraction, division. When it comes to balancing money, it comes back to the basics of law, the basic foundation. And they don't teach sales. People run from sales. If I go down the streets, can I... I'm not going to be rude. If I ask certain people, do you know how to make a million dollars? Can you teach me how to make $100,000 right now? How come we can't? How come right now I can't go to anybody and ask how to make money? Mm. You know what? Well, I find very important in your story is the idea that you know, it's like a lot of these, a lot of young dudes, they, they want to make money, right? They want money. And it's almost like people are trying to tell them you shouldn't want the money. Right. And so you go into like a lot of these youth programs where people aren't talking about money, but when the kid's on the street or when he's like in his neighborhood or when he's talking to his friends or the mom or the mom or the dad, yeah. the mom crying saying bills need to pay to be pay, paid. Mm. That feeling, not the best feeling. Yeah. And you can't go to the government and ask them for any money. You, you, you say, oh, 2901 Jane Street or Grand Ravine resume, they're throw it to the garbage. Mm -hmm. You go to Jane and Finch Mall or your kid mall, how much stores are black owned or even from the community? Yeah. So let me ask this question. Why did your mind shift from I'm going to like, sell trees to make money to I'm going to start my own business. Cause that's not an easy switch, right? Like not a lot of people make that switch. It's not easy. Yeah. Experiences. Right. And so what was the, and personally I had friends who got dipped. I had friends who did, did jail time. Mm -hmm. You know, I got friends who got killed, you know, I got a little trouble back in the day. So I know what's what, and I know what makes sense. And you know what? I can't sell weed worldwide, but guess what? I can sell clothes worldwide. Hmm. And why did you choose clothes? Like, what was? Because I didn't want to be a rapper. Mm -hmm. um, I said I became an Arthur. <laughs> my first book, but I didn't even like to read back in the days, you know. But I just realized too in the school system, it's not that we're bad kids. It's just that we we are so knowledgeable from reality because we, we deal with the streets we deal with reality things every day that this history canadian history and all these geography it doesn't make sense to us so we have we pay least attention to it but you see what we want to learn something we do the most research yeah we're the most and, wisest and, and you also went to school i went to all academic classes yeah no yeah. no um university or college but i did three programs 18 months so tell me about those programs so during those programs I learned more how to do a 30 second pitch. So like right now I can tell you what Grand Slammer is. Grand Slammer is a brand that symbolizes, symbolizes staying positive, staying consistent and sacrificing for better. Before you're a billionaire, you're a millionaire, before you're a millionaire, a thousand. No, I did the 30 second, I can go on and on, but I learned the 30 second pitch. So anywhere I am, I can do that. That's what I learned. I learned how to deal with other people. I just learned more. I learned, I already learned so much from experience from the street. It just me finding the right things that make sense to yeah. me. Like, 
how, how to apply your sales skills to another industry, yeah. <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. I was a new I was a student. Yeah. You know? What, what, where do you think you find that motivation inside yourself? From, you know, my brother, from my family, from, from the people. Tell me I about see. your relationship with Chris, because I, I think that's a, I mean, you guys have a special. Yeah, that's bond. like my twin. You know, he's older yeah. than me, but they say I look older than him, you know, that's good, you know. Chris is a very good role model. You see what I'm saying? He's, he didn't want me to join the streets back in the days, but he had to go play ball. But before then, he had me with him everywhere. You know, my dad is in the picture, but my dad will also did his own things, then Woods was like the dad. So Woods always made sure I was good. You know, he always taught me good. I was the first person to join the gentleman hats. I seen him doing that. I was deep in the streets back in the days, and I seen him, you know, seen him, what he was doing. So I always knew that I'm gonna look like towards. I always looked at it like this too, because I street people, they, not street people, but just people who's involved in streets, they stress out a lot. They overwhelmed. And I always looked at my brother, he's always humble and calm. Money, is the main issue, but he always played it humble. So I always admired him for that. And from there, I always said, you know, I can learn a lot from this brother right here. So, Cause he's from Jane and Finch too. And he was around bad too in the night, 2005 year of the gun. You know, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was in Jane and Finch too, but look what he, look what he became and who he became. He never did nothing with the streets ever. What do you, ever. What, what do you think makes Chris so, unique like he's a different kind of cat man like his 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 leadership in this neighborhood is special and uh i mean you know him as well as anybody has yeah, like yeah. what do you think it is about him that lets him reach so many people he's a real person and you know sometimes he gets um taken advantage of but the reason why because he has that clean heart he's a clean hearted person he will give before he receives and that's what I learned from him. Yeah. So Grand Slammers, how long have you guys been in business now? Roughly four years, three, four, three to five years, I can say. Yeah. I still feel like it's one year. I yeah. still feel like it's the beginning because I'm still learning. Yeah. What are some of the things you've learned since you, since you started running your own business? I learned that, you know, it, it gets lonely. You know, people think that you're automatically winning. What people think is easy, but it's also a blessing when you get the support and you see people wearing it, like Jamil. Like, it's, it's a good feeling, so that feeling is priceless. It's better than money. And I'm just happy to see where it's gonna go in the next five years. Hopefully we can get some, invest vision? some investors. We wanna do like a ro road wide. This is a road, the ro whole world grinds. Third world country is grinding. Everywhere grinds. This is this is like a lifestyle. This is the lifestyle. What are you? I heard you're doing this, that. You're grinding. This is the lifestyle for billionaires or to people who want to gain billions. I created something that um is going to be here for generations and generations and generations because every day there's going to be a baby born and they're going to grow and the grind's going to continue. So this, this brand is relevant. For people who have, let's say, like their life is in the business world, right? Yeah. People who didn't come from Jane and Finch, maybe they come from a very different place. Of course. What does the business world have to offer a Freedom. young man coming up like you? Freedom. Because, you know, it's not like you, it's not easy to become an entrepreneur. But once you start creating, once you start like making your first sale, as I said, like you, you become more Believe you have more confidence. I believe confidence is a big role before in business. You need to have inner confidence. Without that, then it's going to be very difficult because it's not easy. You're going to, what I told them to, I told them to find their passion and create a business in it and find like minded people. Because when you're working, when you're working, it's not that, you know, you can, nothing wrong working, but just don't make that your. If working's your goal, then work all day or all night. If that's not your goal, chase your goal. But discipline and make it work. Yeah. I think one thing people who have not spent time in a neighborhood like Jane and Finch don't always understand 
is that I think a lot of kids here grow up without seeing the business world as a place where they could be successful. You understand? Like you might never, you might, you might never interact with a, with a business leader. You'll see a lot of nonprofits and social workers and teachers and cops, but you might never see someone who runs a company. Yo, I did not know what Jamestown, I did not know Rex, I didn't know nowhere until I was in high school. Like I stayed in Jane and Finch. I didn't take a vacation. I didn't, I didn't be on a plane before. Like all I know was Jane and Finch. And it's because of a teacher that I got suspended at Emory got me, her name is Carrie from the Peach program. Where you, this is a program you go to when you get suspended. I was the type of player in my book, if you read, I was the type of player that was suspended and got to play basketball. The principal who suspended me and the vice principal who suspended me made me play and they're watching me on the Saturday against Eastern Commerce. So that's, these are the type of things that was going on. But my teacher from Peach, she always looked out for me and the youth from the, in the community and she got me into the school program. And then I just got into the next, to the next, to the next. And what, what was the impact of like seeing that business world as an opportunity for you? Yo, I always knew it was out there, but now that I'm in it, it's like sky's the limit. I just want, I just like, I like, as I said, roots. I like roots. Roots is, before me, there was roots, you know, and I just like how they're in, they're everywhere and they're in the urban communities. So, I just want to build my franchise like Roots or do a partnership with Roots or do a partnership with Can Canadian brands because we're going to be in Canada. So even if you mess with us or don't, we're out here. We're going to be touching near you within the next five years. Check out Jason's clothing company, Grand Slammers, on their website, grandslammers1988.com or find them on Instagram at Grand Slammers Apparel. As always, Thank you for listening.